Can a man throwing a spear stop a war? Can a man reading a poem stop a war? Can sworn enemies become friends just for two weeks every four years? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. And it's been going on for quite some time. In fact, over a thousand years. The ancient Greeks sent out a, a message to all the states to stop any wars or altercations they were having so that local citizens could travel safely to this valley called Olympia, where they would hold a celebration of sport and culture. And this celebration was a competition that embraced sport, architecture, music, painting, sculpture, and literature. In fact, the last gold medal was awarded for poetry in London, 1948. And the ancient Greeks believed that the purpose of, of nurturing their citizens was to educate man in both mind and body, and to get them to compete in sport rather than war. And also, the ancient Olympics and the current modern-day Olympics, the golden goals behind it all is to foster friendship amongst young people and to bring people from different nations closer together. Forget the Olympics for a moment and let's look at how sport brings people closer together, even people from warring nations. Imagine this. The First World War, 1914. Can you imagine this? 30 yards away, they could see each other on the Western Front. The British and the German troops were that close. And they managed to throw a message saying, can we stop the war just for a few hours on Christmas Day, 1914, to sing some Christmas carols? And they did. And they climbed out of the trenches and walked gingerly across, shook hands, and then they exchanged tobacco, and they exchanged some chocolates, and a, a German barber actually shaved some of the British lads, and a juggler did a bit of juggling to entertain everybody. And then out of nowhere, a British lad produced a football. And on Christmas Day in 1914, they played football in no man's land, in the mud, for two hours. Sport prevailed. And actually, war stopped for a few moments or a few hours. Fast forward to LA Olympics 1932, deep in the depression. Amidst all that, the Olympics brought great joy to people who were having a hard economic time. And this young lady, little Judy Guinness on the left-hand side, won the gold medal for fencing, but she was hit twice in the chest and the judges didn't see it. And she insisted on taking the silver medal rather than the gold. And in doing so, she proved to a lot of people that there was more value in actually integrity and nobility than actually winning an empty gold medal. And she changed the record books and instilled in a lot of people that honor and nobility is more valuable than just winning a medal. Move on to Hitler's Olympics, 1936, Berlin Olympics. Jesse Owens won four gold medals. In the long jump, or it was called the broad jump in those days, he fouled on his first two jumps. If he did it a third time, he was disqualified. And the guy at the back there, Carl Ludwig Lutz Long, came up to him and said, you're a great jumper. Jump from an inch behind and you'll sail through. And he did just that, sailed through and won the gold at the expense of Carl Ludwig Lutz, who's doing the Nazi salute at the back there. And they became great friends. And they walked out of the stadium arm in arm. They never saw each other after that day, sadly. Lutz died uh, towards the end of the war, in a, in a prison camp, in fact. And, and Jesse Owens never saw him again. But he said the friendship he had for that German fellow called Carl Ludwig Lutz was so strong, was worth more than all the gold and all the medals that he'd won. Um, because this, the friendship and advice he gave him meant more to him and helped him to win that particular event and take the, all four gold medals. They never saw each other again, but I do believe the family still exchanged Christmas cards. And that moment changed a lot of people's thoughts about German people during the height of the, well, what was to become the Second World War. Fast forward on to an American guy, possibly the greatest golfer in his era, um, was a, a fellow by the name of Arnold Palmer. He won seven Masters and captained two Ryder Cup teams with a 12-year gap, an extraordinary guy. But he understood the power of television, and he understood that TV could spread messages. And he said this once on television, I believe golf could solve the world's problems and stop war. He said, if I can just bring the war, the war the warlords from, from war-torn countries together and get them to play golf to decide their issues, that they could find peace in this world. He said, people think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I really believe this. Now, could you imagine Vladimir Putin taking a six-foot putt to decide who gets the oil rights in the Antarctica? It's possible. Nothing is impossible. That is possible. Why not? 
Move on to 1998, France 98 World Cup. And when America, USA, and Iran were pulled out of the bag to play in the same group, it was a political hot potato. Well, what they decided to do was the, they broke the rules. The Americans and the Iranians met for dinner the day before the game. And they decided that they would be, demonstrate great sportsmanship. If one fell, they'd pick up the other. And actually, they won the award for sportsmanship, the two teams, most unusual, two teams to win it. They were magnificent sportsmanship on the day. And at the beginning of the game, the Iranians gave flowers and the Americans gave pin badges to commemorate the event. And the photograph is of the two teams locked together, embraced in the brotherhood of sport. And after it, the Americans invited the Iranians to come and tour in America. So in just 90 minutes of football, they achieved more than 20 years of politicians flapping about not achieving anything. Sport can prevail, and sportsmanship in particular. But this is my favorite study, story, um, Germany 2006. Imagine this, you're playing for your country. Your name is the great Oswald Sanchez, he's a fantastic Mexican goalkeeper. And he's in his hotel room when the phone rings, and he picks it up, and he gets the worst phone call of his life. It's his mother saying, your father, Philippe, has just died of a heart attack. Please come home, he said, I'm coming. Jumped on the plane with permission from the team, flew all the way back, heartbroken, and you know, losing his dream to play for his country, but more so for losing his dad. And when he buried him the next day, they were having coffees and talking, and his mother said, you should go back to the World Cup and play in it. He said, no, no, I'll stay here and grieve with you. He said, no, your father, Philippe, would want you to go back. So he went back, and he arrived back in time for the game on the Sunday, Iran versus Mexico. Now, the tradition is when players shake hands at the beginning, the last people to shake hands are normally the two goalkeepers. And I saw this happen. When Sanchez came down to the Iranian goalkeeper, he put his hand out, and the Iranian turned his back on him and walked away. I was thinking, what is he doing? And the next thing, he bent down and picked up a bunch of flowers. And he gave him the flowers and said, for your father, for your father, your papa. And he hugged him. And it was just a magical and beautiful moment where sportsmanship transcends all the pressure and all the political shenanigans that sometimes are presented in sport. And these kind of stories inspire young people. They love to hear these stories. Here's another one that happened here in Dublin, and it's great to be in Dublin again. Uh, this is Crow Park. Crow Park is a jewel in the crown that the rest of the world doesn't know about because it's used primarily for two Irish sports called Gaelic, Gaelic and Hurling, and they are uh, our national sports, whereas rugby and soccer are foreign sports, and they're minority sports in Ireland. And when they decided to rebuild the rugby ground in the Lansdowne Road, the oldest international ground in the world, we had to find somewhere else to play. So GAA reluctantly allowed rugby, foreign sport, to be played there. Now, you have to remember the context of this, that it was, the GAA kept the Irish culture and heritage alive during the difficult times of oppression from the British um, military might. And in 1920, uh, British troops went in and shot 14 Irish citizens dead. And so you can understand why the idea of rugby, a foreign sport, being played there. But when England come to town and the English rugby team were to arrive and to sing the national anthem and God save the Queen in this hallow ground, you can understand how that was so upsetting for a lot of people who had family related to the terrible moments that, that happened yesteryear. So the worry was that they'd be hissed and booed during the national anthem and there'd be riots, people running onto the pitch and the riots on the street outside. And it was quite a worry. Anyways, as it happened, there was absolute silence from the Irish crowd for the English national anthem. And at the end of the game, I met Oli Campbell, one of Ireland's greatest rugby heroes, and he said to me, that moment of the national anthems was his greatest moment in his rugby career, greater than anything he achieved for Ireland or for the Lions. And that was the moment when there was an act of sporting reconciliation, an act of sporting reconciliation, and it happened in Crow Park. Staying in Crow Park just last year, this is Kerry versus Dublin, the All-Ireland final, when the two arch enemies come together. It was a fantastic final. Dublin hadn't won it for 16 years. They'd waited to get their hands on the Sam Maguire Cup for 16 years. And they were locked level with just a minute or so to go, and they get a penalty 45 yards out. And Stephen Cluxton, the, the Dublin goalkeeper, steps up, kicks it through the posts, and within a minute, the game was over, and Dublin had won the Sam Maguire, the All-Ireland Final. But everybody was celebrating, and very few people saw this, but one photographer did. And this is Sean Oak, Tom, Tom O'Shea, should I say, from Kerry, picking up the ball, bringing it back to Cluxton, the goalkeeper, and saying, you deserve this. Dignity, 
and graciousness, graciousness in defeat are a fantastic thing. And young people seeing that, he's, he's a real good role model for young people to see that there's nothing wrong with losing as long as you give your best and to be dignified about it. And what a great man of dignity is Thomas O'Shea. Let's move to London. I live in London. London 2012 Olympics were absolutely fantastic, a celebration of sport and culture. And, you know, it really was an exciting time. The whole of the city came alive and there were 70,000 volunteers that worked really long hours uh, before, during and after the event. And it made it the friendly games because the place was alive. It was a real buzz to be in London. There was just a, a fantastic atmosphere. In fact, we were getting up to three stories about sportsmanship every day from the Olympics coming in. People sending them into us, we post them on the Facebook and on our go. For example, North Korea and South Korea, a magical moment. These two countries are technically, officially at war together, yet they played a game of table tennis. And at the end, they went off together and they chattered about table tennis, how wonderful sport can be, and sportsmanship, the decency of it to, can prevail. And I guess we can't talk about the Olympics being in Dublin without mentioning the great Katie Taylor, who won Ireland's only gold medal as a boxer. Well, before her fight, there was another fight with this young lady, Nicola Adams, for Britain. And a funny thing happened, or a wonderful thing happened. All the Irish fans stood up and cheered her on. Every single punch lifted the roof. And it was spotted by John McEnroe, the tennis player. He said, wasn't that extraordinary? The, English, the Irish fans cheering an English girl on like that. Wasn't that amazing? And it was spotted by somebody else, which is Clive Woodward, Sir Clive Woodward. He said, Irish supporters screamed their heads off for Katie, but they were just as vocal for Nicola. This is a fantastic advertisement for the sport. And it was too. Mind you, she's got such a wonderful face, a smiling face. A smile is a great thing. And you can see wherever she goes. But I want to tell you briefly before I finish. I grew up in Dublin in the, in the 60s, watching black and white television. And I remember this, the World Cup final, England, Germany. Half our house was up for England, and half our house was up for Germany. But in one of the earlier games, uh, I noticed this guy who ran like a chicken. His name was Eusebio, but he was also the best goal scorer in the world. He scored, he was the Golden Boots boy of 1966. Two years later, he comes back to Wembley Stadium to play against Manchester United, the Busby Babes. Uh, George Best and all of that. One all, dying minutes, he's clean through, shoots, goalkeeper saves it, Alex Stephanie saves it, and he does this. He goes up and he applauds Alex Stephanie and puts his arm around him and claps him. And when I, I told this story to some 400 kids out in Dubai a few weeks ago, and they spontaneously broke into applause, which was one of those emotional moments. In Kulak here in Dublin, I told the same story to a bunch of kids, to two storytelling sessions, and two of the kids snuck back in for the second session because they just got into the stories. Young people like these stories about sportsmanship. So these stories seem to trigger something with the kids. And then I got letters from teachers saying there are children reading this book of sportsmanship stories that never read a book before in their lives. And that told me there's something here that's connecting with the young people. So what we're doing is uh, trying to get people to send us their stories to, so we can share them. So we want the stories to collide. We want the stories to come in on Facebook and young people are sending them into us and then we can share and pass them on and they can share and pass them on and discuss them further. And we share them on YouTube and on all of different platforms, the blog, Facebook, Twitter, the lot. So we want the stories come in colliding and being shared. And we want sportsmanship uh, stories because sportsmanship, I believe, can, can actually save the world from unnecessary aggravation, uh, from unnecessary rage, from unnecessary low self-esteem, um, and, and oftentimes it can actually stop us and save us from war. And finally, sportsmanship, I believe, can actually change the world. It can help a whole new generation of young people to boost their literacy, and more importantly, boost their belief and optimism in mankind and to become a new generation of global citizens. Thank you.